Wall Street Week with Louis Rukeyser is made possible by the financial support of viewers like you. By the travelers, insurance and related financial services working to provide financial peace of mind for American business. By Enron, providing natural gas which holds the promise for a cleaner world and a more energy independent America. Enron Corp. and the Enron Foundation. And by Prudential Bates Securities. Rock solid. Market wise. Produced Friday, October 26. Our panelists are Ralph Acampora, Julius Westheimer, and Martin Zweig. Tonight's special guest is Richard C. Breeden, Chairman, Securities and Exchange Commission. Good evening, I'm Louis Rukeyser. This is Wall Street Week. Welcome back. Well, you may think that nobody was having any fun in Washington this week, but that just shows how little you know. Why, just yesterday, President Bush demonstrated that he has his priorities straight when he took time out from raising taxes to give a tour of the Oval Office to that eminent economic analyst, Bo Derrick. Thereby making the final score for the week, Bo 10, George nothing. As the President continued to ponder in apparent astonishment why being a good guy and an eager compromiser didn't seem to work out very well in making a deal with Dan Rostenkowski. The ungrate communicator was faced with three formidable tasks. In ascending order of difficulty, they were first winning back the country, second figuring out what next week's Bush economic policy will be, and third getting back on speaking terms with the House Republicans. Saddam Hussein, where are you when he needs you? But if having a 10 visiting at the White House offered a stark contrast with the president's own recent score, there were a bundle of other numbers casting gloom on the national scene as well. Numbers like six, the number of months to which the mayor of the nation's capital was sentenced to the slammer on drug charges. Or five, the number of hundreds of billions of dollars by which congressional leaders swear their latest tax increase will reduce the nation's deficit over the next five years. And if you believe that, folks, you've probably been smoking something a little strange yourself lately. Or numbers like 84, the number of points the Dow Jones Industrials lost this week as investors began to calculate the real costs of slowing down an already inert economy by letting the Gallup poll dictate economic policy two weeks before a national election. Meanwhile, back at the economy, the numbers weren't so hot either. Factory orders for durable goods slumped for the second month in a row. Home sales went even deeper into the septic tank. And consumer confidence, understandably shaken by Washington's recent twin attacks of amnesia and deja vu, plunged to its lowest level in eight years. Ironically, one of the few bright spots was auto sales where, as viewers of this program were tipped off last week, sales of U.S. built cars and trucks are showing unexpected resilience in the face of all the headlines about higher gasoline prices. The world oil price, for its part, moved so hysterically this week that you might have thought somebody had figured out a way to use it in program trading. After a record drop on Monday, oil finished the week virtually unchanged above $33 a barrel and the price-sensitive bond market also ended almost right back where it began. With the political, economic, and financial worlds all producing such daunting numbers, how confident can people feel about investing for their own futures? And not to put too fine a point on it, how honest is Wall Street these scandal-ridden days? Tonight, we'll be putting those questions to the guy who gets paid to keep the financial markets honest, the chairman of the SEC. But first, let's check out the numbers on Wall Street. And as the Dow Jones Industrial Average indicates, last week's brief euphoria vanished amid renewed concerns about the Middle East, the budget package, and the financial strength of leading banks. The index of 30 blue chip stocks surrendered nearly 85 points to close at 2436.14. And there was nothing to cheer in the broader market indexes either. 
Our elves remain unchanged on the market's technical outlook for the next six months, netting out to a mildly bearish minus two. Gold and the dollar each perked up slightly after their recent poundings, but losers of the week included Buster Douglas, Silver, and the American taxpayer. But as I noted earlier, some people in Washington still know how to have fun. Even when deepening the raid on private citizens while speaking darkly of the need for tighter belts, Congress managed to keep in the budget such vital national interests as the renovation of the House of Representatives kitchen, dining room, and beauty parlor at a total cost of more than $2 million. Oh, well, boys and girls just want to have fun. And what's another couple of million between friends? Marty Zweig, how serious are the problems in the nation's financial system? I think they're extremely serious. They're the worst in decades. You've been warning about this for a long time. This week, Citicorp had to pay 12.5% for some of its paper, right. a suggestion of lack of confidence on the part of at least some investors. Many people are asking whether we're going to have major bank failures. What's your view? We probably are going to have some bank failures. I don't know what the government will do as banks approach the wall. Uh, there's several banks now that more or less are, are dead, but they're still operating. But the problem is they have to sell off assets in order to keep their capital up, and the banks shrink. And as their asset base shrinks, they can't loan out money, and that's the real problem because banks are contracting and the marginal borrowers shut out, and that kills the economy. What can or should the government do? I don't know if they can do anything. They can't stop real estate prices from going down, and it's too late to stop the credit binge of the 1980s. I think the system is unwinding on itself, and I don't think that the government can do a whole heck of a lot. Do I get the sense that you're getting even more bearish as the months go by? Yes, probably true, because of what's going on with the unwinding of the debt. Do you expect uh, a deep recession? If we're lucky. You think it might be worse than that? Yes. The word beyond that used to be depression. Is that the word you're thinking? You said it. I didn't. Okay. Uh, now, in terms of the stock market, does that mean that people ought to get out? Well, they should be cautious. The market, by the way, and I assume that we're in a bear market, the rallies in bear markets are unbelievable. They're stronger than rallies in bull markets, so it's not easy either. But I would be cautious. Well, suppose someone had not been astute enough to... Uh, be cautious when you first recommended that. Would you now tell them to get out or would you tell them to hang on for a bounce? If you get a bounce, I'd lighten up. If you don't get a bounce, I'd lighten up. But hopefully you get a bounce. Well, thank you for those cheerful words. It's always encouraging to talk <laughs> with you. <laughs> Julius Westheimer, you have the job of dealing with retail customers who listen to words like they just heard from Marty. Uh, do you share his assessment? I'm not quite as pessimistic as uh, Marty is. As a well, neither was Cassandra. <laughs> <laughs> no, I know that. I think this uh, is the time to get in for the long term. And I look at it this way, Lewis. If you were in a shopping mall and you saw a sign over your favorite men's store, quality merchandise, suits, shirts, ties, 25, 30% off, I bet you'd walk in and take a look. And I tell people these days, there's a sale going on in Wall Street. There's some good values out there that are severely marked down. And I'm not saying you have to go in and buy and spend all your money, but at least go in and take a look. And don't turn your back on walls. Now, these values may get better. I don't know. But I think there's some good values out there. People want to make sure that they'll still be there to do the alterations next year. Yes, that's true. But you take stocks like American Home Products and General Electric and Minnesota Mining and Coke. Same companies they always were, Lou, but their prices have been marked down. So for the long pull, why not at least take a look? Are you advising people to buy bonds? Yes, people who are middle-aged or elderly and who are in tax brackets over 28%, tax-free bonds today are very attractive with part of their money. But don't put all your eggs in the bond basket. You need some growth against inflation also. Okay, Ralph Hakampur, Marty says, run for the hills. Julia says, this is the time you buy the bargains. You're the only uh, acknowledged full-fledged technician here. What do you say? Well, I think I, uh, I kind of agree with both just a little bit. Um, I am concerned about the long term and the reason why I'm concerned about the long term is some of what Marty was talking about the banks I and mean, you're talking about structural problems but Julius is right there are some bargains here and I see leadership I see if you want to outperform the market you should stay in stocks like foods utilities drugs it's very very selective Lou but you can be in the market but to say that uh, you're hundred percent invested I think that's a mistake it's um, I uh, feel that people are talking bearish, not acting bearish. We're down a lot again today on very, very light volume. And I don't think this bear market's going to end until they capitulate in the big stocks. It's like the 70s when we had the nifty 50 market.
they call it something different today. It's called indexing. And I think we have to unwind the indexers. So and that'll happen over the next couple of months. You think we'll go considerably lower then before we start moving up? Well, like Marty, I'm looking for this rally. And I'd be very honest, I've been looking for the rally for the last couple of weeks. It's like keeping a beach ball on the water. When you let your hand go, you get a little vacuum rally. This ball is going down, not up. So I, I sense that we'll probably go a little bit lower, get the rally, and then uh, test the lows again. Uh, we have to see the capitulation of blue chips. Thank you for your cheerful words. I really feel much better now. In any event, gentlemen, it's time now to play our local version of Wheel of Fortune, answer some questions from our viewers. Marty Zweig, Frederick Ruckert of Cary, Illinois, shares your concern about debt. In this case, the rate at which state and local governments are issuing municipal bonds, which in turn, he notes, are often insured by various organizations. Some, he adds, wryly, with acronyms too difficult to pronounce, much less remember. If defaults should occur, he asks, who's watching these insurers? to determine just how big a hit they could take relative to their capital strength and outstanding risks. Do the insurers stand alone or can risk coverage be spread among reinsurers? Well, the rating agencies such as Moody's and Standard & Poor's are on top of these and to maintain their AAA ratings, they have to show that in the worst case scenario, they'll still have their capital intact. The worst case scenario was in the, in the 1930s when 16% of the municipalities defaulted for an average of seven years. Now, who knows what the worst case would be here. They can reinsure, by the way. By the way, these companies only cover the interest and principal payments due during the period of default. So it doesn't mean they have to pay off on an entire issue if the municipality can come back. The other problem is that they're very over-leveraged, in some cases 200 to 1. So you're not recommending this area of investment? I, I wouldn't want to buy the stocks, no. Uh, as for the municipal bonds on their own merits, I might own some. Okay, Julius Westheimer, how would you respond to John Deason of Rush City, Minnesota, who writes me as follows. I have on, account, on occasion encountered the term the prudent man theory for investing. Is this merely a euphemism for a highly conservative mode of investing, or is there more to it than that? Also, will you please explain to me the meaning of secular gains in the market? As a retired minister, I was not aware that there was anything religious, let alone spiritual, about the market. Am I missing something <laughs> here? I am confused by the term and even more confused as to how to realize some of those unholy gains in the market of today. Okay, let's take those one at a time. Uh, I spent the last 24 hours with a dictionary. Prudent means sage, wise, good judgment, and things like that. It doesn't always mean conservative. Somebody who just hit the lotto, for example, for $10 million, might come in and say, I want to speculate, I want to shoot crap. Now, it's prudent to let that man do it with part of his money. It's not necessarily what you'd recommend to elderly people or young children or something like that. Now, as for secular, that means a couple things. It means, in the business context, long term. Webster says, from century to century. Now, I hope we don't have to wait 100 years for these gains or anything like that. It also means uh, secular as opposed to cyclical. It doesn't rise and fall with a business cycle. Long term investing is secular, the kind I recommend. Bless you, my child. Thank you. <laughs> Ralph Akampura, Joel Peskoff of Brooklyn, New York, has heard that the lifting of Japanese import restrictions on American beef next year may double Japan's present 25% consumption of our exported